Um, yeah, so I'm Le Tendo, uh, Associate Professor in Chemical Engineering. Uh, it's my great honor to mod, uh, moderate this panel discussion. Uh, first of all, let's, um, I think uh, uh, everyone enjoyed uh, the great lectures a moment ago by Professor Ty Sargent, so I don't need to introduce him again, <laughs> so I will skip that. But let's welcome the, the, our, our, our main uh, panelists again. And uh, now I'd like to spend a few minutes introduce the rest of the, the panelists. Okay, so we have a very diverse and young and energetic <laughs> panel okay, here. So first is Professor Arang Man Manudi Kanakisodi. <laughs> Hopefully my pronunciation is correct. Uh, he is a, a kind of assistant professor in the School of uh, Materials Engineering. And his research interest is novel materials discovery through uh, high throughput density functional theory and machine learning. And he's also uh, very active in, in searching new uh, halide pearl sky materials for solar cell and uh, optoelectronics devices. He joined Purdue about two years ago. Um, let's welcome him. <laughs> and uh, next is uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Bryce Savoy, who is uh, uh, currently the Charles Davidson uh, Associate Professor in Chemical Engineering. And his research interest is uh, computational method development for materials design, uh, pro property prediction, and the degradation mechanism studies. He is the uh, uh, leader, uh, PI of uh, um, 7.5 million <laughs> DOD funded uh, MURI uh, program here. And he, he is actively studying the degradation process of organic materials, pro scan materials. Um, yeah, let's welcome Professor Woy. And next is a Professor Peter Bermo from, uh, he's currently the Elmore Associate Professor from uh, School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. His research interest is uh, improving performance of photovoltaics and uh, microelectronics using uh, nanophotonics uh, principles. And uh, he is uh, also a leader of uh, a big center, a big effort regarding scalable asymmetric life cycle engagement microelectronics work Workforce Development Program. Sorry, the name is pretty long. I have to use this. And uh, this is uh, a multi-university, a big project uh, led by Purdue by Professor uh, Peter Bomo. So let's welcome him. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, uh, Professor uh, Shubra Banso. Uh, she is currently associate professor in the mechanical engineering, a school of mechanical engineering. Uh, her research interest is perovskite, uh, tricotinite, and the 2D materials, semiconductor materials. And she is also expert in interconnects and uh, electronics device integrations. Uh, she, she was an associate professor in the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, uh, a very fun place. <laughs> and she just moved to Purdue a, a few months ago. Um, but unfortunately, this week she is uh, out of town. So, she, uh, but she kindly agreed to join the panel virtually. Um, so let's welcome her. Can we see? Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So that's uh, the, all the panelists for today. And uh, now let's uh, let's get started. So <laughs> to get this started, I prepared a, a, a few uh, simple, naive questions. Maybe some of this point has been touched upon uh, by Professor Ted Sargent uh, during his lectures. But now we have more opportunities to to dive into more details on those topics. Uh, probably we'll spend uh, 20 to 30 minutes on, on three or four questions, and then we'll open the, the floor to the general audience. And I hope, look forward to more interesting <laughs> questions from the audience okay, after that. Okay, so first question is, so over the past several decades, there has been several waves of photovoltaic research. However, the implementation is quite slow. So so we, we, we haven't have uh, uh, too much solar panels right, in, in, in our daily life. But now recently, the silicon panel cost has become low enough, right, and ProSky provides additional uh, very exciting opportunities to further lower down the, uh, the, I will sit down, uh, the cost. <laughs> so, so the question is, uh, when 
do you guys think PV technology will really start to play a major role in our society? For example, like producing, really generating 30 per 30 40% of the, the energy for, for our daily life. Uh, and, and to realize that, except for searching for new, better materials, uh, what are the, uh, the current major uh, obstacles uh, to realize that goal? Um, so probably I'll ask uh, Ted to, to start with, and then Peter and, uh, and Shubra can, can follow up. Um, actually, I think we should start with Peter. And Peter looks like he's got a lot of like, original things to say compared okay. to, no, I think it's on already. I think is it on? Okay. Yeah, I think it's on. I think we start with Peter. I, I've said a lot of what I have to say on this. Let's go to Peter. All right. So thanks, Ted. Uh, so first of all, photovoltaics is absolutely crucial technology. I'm in full agreement 100% with Ted. And I think the future belongs to photovoltaics. It's such a... Uh, fantastic opportunity because there's so much power available through the sun and we are at the point now where it is actually having like increasingly large impact on society it's been growing exponentially for the last 10 years or more since we kind of reached uh, what some people have called the grid parity regime where the cost of installing new solar was comparable to the cost of installing or even in some cases maintaining other types of conventional fossil fuels. So it looks like the future is bright for PV, but there are some major challenges as well. So one of the biggest challenges going forward will be finding ways to accommodate more and more solar energy on the grid. And so that means like finding ways to use solar power effectively. Uh, and that includes uh, having a grid that can support uh, kind of variable generation, and we already have ways to do that. So it is possible to do that, just to be clear. And there are some places where uh, solar is actually like a very large fraction of the total energy mix. So we're well below that now in most of the United States, but certain locations like Hawaii are much further along than Indiana, for example. Partially because they have more solar resource, but also because the cost of alternatives was higher, so they reached grid parity earlier. Uh, but we are at that point now in Indiana and many other places throughout the United States, North America, and worldwide, where it will make a, more and more sense. But then the second thing beyond the grid challenge will be the question of land use. And it will be important to find land areas that can productively accommodate solar energy while also supporting their primary original uh, goals. So that includes not just urban areas, which is actually not a huge amount of area if you just look at rooftops, but also could include other parts of the urban infrastructure, could include uh, areas that are near cities, uh, such as agricultural lands, and also other types of uh, land that can accommodate the potential for solar energy. And then another thing that will be obviously very critical is to provide uh, better ways uh, to utilize uh, solar energy in a wider variety of uses. And so that could include uh, some of the uh, solar fuels uh, initiatives that Ted was talking about, but it could also include greater electrification of existing applications that we care about, including transportation. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Peter, that was an astonishing answer. I just want to compliment my fellow panelists here. Very comprehensive. No, I'm being very serious. Um, I don't really have much to add. I'm the computational person. But I, I, uh, I think that I was just going to kind of piggyback on the finding creative uses for it as well, because there are formidable infrastructure challenges to accommodating photovoltaics. I think on the long-term long horizon, uh, there's just so much uh, net potential in photovoltaics that it's, it's bound to happen. So it's a when, not an if. But there will possibly need to be incentives to close the gap as soon as we want to and as soon as we need to. Um, but the, the applications that don't necessarily have to have you on the grid are also kind of compelling if you could couple it to chemical production um, so that you could store it locally or put it to innovative uses. Uh, that could, uh, you know, help address these load leveling issues. That could also be very advantageous. Yeah, um, 
Right. Okay, yeah, I can make a couple of quick comments. I mean, yeah, that uh, was pretty comprehensive from, from both uh, both of you guys. Uh, I'm also a computational person. I'd make just a, a one general comment and one specific comment. The general comment would be about, you know, further incentivizing the use of it, which also was touched upon just now, but, you know, maybe, you know, uh, the, obviously the costs have, uh, you know, lessened over the years. There's There's now a lot more availability of, of, you know, solar power. So, you know, maybe just more people, the more people start using it, the better it would be. But I wanted to comment something from the computational perspective, which is like, you know, uh, in terms of, I mean, of course, search for better materials is always, you know, we, we are doing that all along. Uh, there are a number of things where, you know, uh, fundamental, uh, you know, uh, computational simulations, atomistic simulations can still help, I believe. So, you know, th th there's a lot of things that we can still understand, uh, like, uh, you know, ion migration or, you know, defect tolerance in, in these materials. So, you know, I'm sort of bringing in specific things that I, I like to do, but, you know, just in terms of materials that are already being used, you know, perovskite solar cells or, you know, cadmium telluride related solar cells, there's still, although it seems like it's a saturated field, but there's still a lot of work going on in studying kinetics and, and you know, activation of dopants in cattle, for example. How does ion migration happen? Uh, interfaces, what's going on at interfaces? So I feel like if we can further improve the theory more, you know, this would involve like creating new force fields, for example, right? Machine learning comes into the picture there. We typically use density functional theory simulations, but you know, it's expensive and you know, the level of theory is important, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, you know, this may not directly contribute to PV technology being in everybody's homes tomorrow, but I think there's a lot more fundamental work still to be done and, you know, funding structures can incentivize that as well. You know, so, so I, I think we can, you know, from first principle simulations, molecular dynamic simulations, improve the level of theory that we can use, improve the capabilities in terms of the properties that we can study, the effect of, you know, defects, uh, interfaces, uh, you know, uh, uh, mixing and matching between known materials, like, you know, mix chalcogenide and halide perovskites together maybe, I don't know, you know. So things like that are what I think computations could, could maybe help with, you know, and as well as, you know, data science or machine learning related techniques, which I'll talk about it a little more in, ne in the next few questions, I think. So, yeah. yeah, great. Uh, how about Professor Benso? You have uh, any thoughts on that? Uh. Good, good point. And Ted, do you want to summarize? <laughs> you know, uh, maybe I'll just see if I can ping Peter on something. There was a number, but you might have the number. In the last couple of years in southern Germany, on a sunny day, solar has been meeting like a fairly high, high fraction. It might be 40 or 60 or something percent of total demand. And Munich didn't catch fire. The place didn't blow up, you know. And, and so I'm not to say that there isn't more work to be done on the grid. But there is, and I'm sure we should work on it. But there are certainly, there are locales that have been instantaneously receiving a, a large portion of their energy from solar and have been able to manage it. Yes, that's correct. And I believe that there are even like instants in time where you have uh, the total production of power is, is matching essentially all the, uh, the short-term power needs. And obviously this is a moment-to-moment -moment thing, so that doesn't mean that like Germany is 100% solar overall, but it just means there are certain locations at certain very specific times a day uh, where that's happening. And that's really interesting development that that even can happen. And so you actually get to the point where you need to think about either transporting or storing solar power because you're generating so much power. 
So that is going to be like one of the key challenges in terms of the grid. How do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah, great points. Um, yeah, so maybe it's time to move to the second second question. Uh, so the, the second question I have is: so the world is very excited about Hila ProSky, right? And uh, so the question is: is ProSky the real future for uh, photovoltaic? Uh, uh, and are we really I could just put too much uh, excitement on that? Or this is really the, 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 the promising future. Right? So kind of stability and the manufacturing issues being resolved on the ProSky technology, uh, in your op opinion, what do you think in the next five to 10 years? Will this happen? <laughs> Who want to go first? Oh, we have a few people work on ProSky. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't think I should go first, but I might as well. Uh, so, I mean, you know, we, we, it, that this was already discussed. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the most qualified person to, to, to suggest, you know, to talk about its, you know, practical usage or like, you know, when it will actually start being deployed. Uh, you know, once again, I mean, I assume I'm here as the, you know, <laughs> computational or machine learning person, so I can comment from, from that point of view. Uh, I think uh, in terms of, you know, I think Poroskais are definitely the future, but, you know, there's probably a, a lot of shortcomings. I mean, the stability, of course, right? So uh, I feel like there, there's, again, a lot of things. So personally, we are trying to do a few things which can help address it, right? Which is, uh, you know, uh, ways to address the stability, you know? Uh, can we come up with possible degradation mechanisms? Uh, can we come up with, you know, ways to predict, like, you know, uh, halide segregation or, you know, phase segregation? Uh, again, it comes back to the improvement of theory itself, like, you know, to, to, to make these predictions better. Uh, but, you know, I, I also want to mention that we have been focusing on making more ensemble predictions rather than giving you one prediction for a property, which means that, you know, there, there's a range of uh, properties that a material can exhibit based on which, you know, phase it could exist in, all the metastable phases, there is a tendency in zero Kelvin DFT, for example, to give you that, you know, here is the optimized structure and here are the property. So, so we are focusing a lot more on uh, creating like instability, using instability as a factor itself. So I feel like, you know, if we, if we use that in terms of screening as well, we can further improve, like, you know, uh, the scope, like, you know, uh, uh, properties that we have, we may not have exhausted the possibilities, like, you know, the, the attractive properties that we can achieve from already known materials itself. Are there ways to better mix and match them? You know, are there, is there, like, you know, some, uh, you know, other, you know, metastable phase th th that we're missing, uh, et cetera. So that is one thing that I wanted to talk about. In terms of, you know, the practical usage, when can it be deployed? What is the future? Like, you know, I, I hope there is a bright future. I think we talked about it a little bit before, uh, you know, tandem uh, perovskite solar cells are, you know, hopefully the way to go. If we can accelerate the prediction of, you know, like uh, Professor Sargent said, like, you know, we can, in, in, without using lead tin perovskites, can we get, you know, low band gap perovskites, which are very stable, do not, you know, phase segregate, blah, blah, blah. Without doing iodine bromine mixing, can we get high band gap perovskites, which are defect tolerant, for example. So we do a lot of work on defect tolerance, you know, uh, for example, like, you know, can you, can you design these perovskites in such a way that defects are not going to form spontaneously and, you know, uh, affected properties, or you can put in functional defects or dopants, et cetera, right? So, so that's my perspective on it. I hope there's a bright future, and I would like to contribute in, you know, in new, newer, fresher ways, if possible, you know, based bouncing off on ideas from everybody, probably. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree. So, from materials chemistry point of view, there's uh, the stability and the processability. They are conflict with each other. Right? If you make things more easy to solution process, right, you lose the, you decrease the, the strength of the bonding, you, you increase the stability issue. So, is there a way to go around that? <laughs> um, Maybe Brad, I think about this. <laughs> Are you on comment? Yeah, I, I would just, I, I would strike a very optimistic note. So for for those of you who haven't followed the Provsky field closely, I mean, it's really unprecedented in terms of how rapidly the efficiency has risen. And we are, we've barely scratched the surface in terms of stabilization techniques that can be deployed. So it's very early for a materials platform to be so seriously considered as a translational technology. So I think it's, I'm extremely optimistic about perovskites. Um, yeah, the fact that we're having this conversation is kind of astonishing. Uh, if coming from a field that, um, I won't name the field, but where I did a lot of my PhD work, things had moved so slow when I was entering it, it was already, already had about 20 years of inertia behind it. 
and they were barely starting to have those kinds of conversations that perovskites have been having. So I'm very optimistic. Cool. Thanks. And Professor Bonso, you have any comments in terms of the mechanical reliability and stability side? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thanks for the comment. I totally agree. The lead is magic, but <laughs> if you find another one without, uh, beyond lead, that will be uh, another <laughs> big, big breakthrough <laughs> in the future. Yeah. And okay, yeah. so first of all, perovskites are an amazing technology, and there are amazing people working on them. So, so I, I want to be very clear about that. I'm very impressed by the perovskite research. I would, I would inject a slight note of caution in the sense of like, will perovskites directly replace incumbent technologies. I don't, I don't want to predict that right now, but I also don't want to not predict it. So in other words, I, I think it's gonna be an open playing field in terms of materials. And I do think that what would be important for perovskites to be commercially adopted is to offer competitive advantage that existing technologies cannot. So that's where the tandem approaches are actually probably from a commercial perspective the most promising because that gives you higher efficiencies than you could ever get from just a, a single junction design and potentially at a cost competitive price. And so that's really the key to make it like actually still be co cost competitive with incumbent uh, silicon technologies. It can't be like an order of magnitude more expensive if you want it to be widely uh, deployed commercially. I would add another thing though, which is it, it's not just about uh, photovoltaics as much as we all love the, the photovoltaics, but there are a lot of other interesting projects in terms of using perovskites for other types of photonic devices, like lasers, LEDs, et cetera. And that, that could actually be the lowest hanging fruit for perovskites, where they offer like a real advantage in terms of performance and cost and could actually tolerate like slightly higher cost of encapsulation and stabilization compared to PV technology. So that's something I would encourage a lot of the researchers there to think about. Yeah, good, great. Yeah, you mentioned the lasers, LEDs, maybe I thought <laughs> about to that. So you have beautiful work on, on LEDs and uh, photonics. So what do you think uh, on solar cells and also on other applications, what's your opinion? <laughs> Yeah, on the LEDs, uh, we've worked on a few colors, but I guess I'm particularly excited if we could produce a blue LED that was at just the right wavelength, 467 nanometers, was um, reliable, achieved an EQE of 18 or 20 percent, 
and had a very narrow emission line, line width with perovskites, um, because then we would fill an unmet need that's not currently being met with, uh, with the quantum dot technologies. The quantum dots are doing, meaning most of those specs pretty well in the green and the red, but not yet in the blue. So we're very interested in whether we could um, contribute in advance using perovskites in that uh, context. But do worry about stability is even worse <laughs> in, in LEDs. The, the challenge is, is more significant. Yeah, I think that's I that's a fair point. I, as you and I were discussing a bit in your office today, Latin, I feel there may be a reason for that related to the fact that we haven't got the contacts quite right yet. There's enough evidence that the excessive voltage currently needed to drive perovskite LEDs, actually, especially the blue ones, might have some, might be attributable to some kind of local energetic barrier that we may be able to remedy with a better choice of hole injectors. So you're right, the stability is far from where it needs to be. I think we may be able to find the implements to address that. And more like effort needs to be devoted into that. A compared with solar cell LED is a much smaller community, you know. So, yeah. Great, good, good points. Um, yeah, let's move to the third question. And maybe after that, we'll open to the to the uh, audience, uh, we can have more more, more questions uh, from the audience. So the third question is: What are the what are the best ways to handle the electricity generated by PV? So Ted, your talk you mentioned the, the electro uh, catalysis CO two reduction as right? as way to store the uh, the, the energy uh, in, into chemical fuels, and maybe you can also store in in a battery or, or directly use use the electricity. So what are the challenges towards those different directions? And is there any other ways, uh, better ways, or more creative ways to, to utilize the, the electricity generated from solar? So. Um, OK, I yeah. can start. So there's a lot of opportunities here. And a lot of it, in my opinion, in the short term, is going to be about electrification of many of the things that we do day to day, particularly things like transportation, uh, like replacing some of the fuels uh, with electricity, like battery storage. Um, and that is something that's a, a proven technology. However, there is a consumer challenge at the moment, which is do people feel confident about buying uh, particularly like plug-in hybrid or just pure electric vehicles if they think that they need to take long trips? And maybe 90% of the time they don't, but that 10% of the time they do, they really care about that issue. So being able to extend the range through innovations in battery technology will also have synergistic benefits for photovoltaic adoption, I believe. And there are a lot of other scenarios and cases, like if you think about lawnmowers and many other things that use liquid fuels, there is potential for electrification. Uh, at the same time, I do think there is long-term potential for solar fuels, as were, was discussed. Uh, I think the biggest challenge there is to bridge the efficiency gap between uh, electricity to battery versus electricity to solar fuels, uh, and also to make it cost competitive. But if you can do that, obviously, there's going to be a lot of adoption. And there are certain technologies, uh, such as, uh, for example, like jet fuels, where you're never going to replace uh, like a long, long distance, long haul jet flight uh, with a battery. So at least I don't see how that could happen. So, so you would expect that, especially those kind of markets, will have like adoption of solar fuels first if anybody's going to adopt them. Brad, uh, I'm. I think <laughs> that. Um, well, the other half of my research is on batteries, and it's sort of <laughs> for a reason because it's a well. So. Batteries are, it, they're similar to what we've been discussing with perovskite research because there's so many fundamental challenges when it comes to storage. There's still a lot of unresolved chemistry, fundamental knowledge gaps. Um, at the same time, uh, there is this huge relevance, right? So, uh, you know, lithium ion technology has decades of research behind it and it's not going to solve grid, grid scale storage. And so we have to learn to do what we did over decades with lithium ion technology for you know, sodium and for more scalable battery chemistries. Um, I was having a conversation with a battery company um, about the context of fluoride ion batteries. So we're interested in fluoride ion because they potentially have very high energy densities. And they were sketching out the roadmap and they were saying that, you know, if everything works, like the electrolyte that we've developed 
uh, if let's say that that checks all the boxes. Moving down, we have no further materials development, and they're saying that the soonest that they would be envisioning adoption would be 25 years. Based on all of their scale up, they were estimating, you know, yeah, all the challenges that would inevitably happen with scaling up and with sort of reaching the kinds of storage capacities. So um, I think we have to work really hard on accelerating that time scale. Um, and it, it's, it's, not, it's not a real attractive problem, but I think it's a very important one on, on speeding up that translational time scale. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the good points. Aaron? Yeah, I can make a quick comment. Uh, one of the avenues I thought was interesting is the hydrogen energy storage uh, route where, uh, you know, it seems like there's a lot more funding coming in that direction, like the DOE hydrogen program and stuff. So, you know, uh, you, since, you know, uh, like Ted mentioned in his talk too, there's been a lot of work done on water splitting. I have done some work in the past. So, you know, you, the same techniques that we are using to discover new absorbers and stuff like that can be used to discover, you know, new catalysts for, for water splitting. And then, you know, this will, then you need like good materials for hydrogen energy storage. And then, you know, you need to re-electrify it Etc. So of course there are challenges involved in that, but I think that is a promising direction. You know that's something uh, you know we, we've been thinking about. You know uh, my my depth of knowledge is not too much more in in this in this uh, topic, but you know the uh, apart from the electrochemical you know energy storage, I think the uh, hydrogen avenue is something worth pursuing. Uh, you know uh, computational screening can be used there as well uh, effectively. I think. Yeah. Okay. Actually, we have an expert on the electrochemistry here in the audience. Maybe he can come once <laughs> later, uh, <coughs> once um, after the. Yeah. Please feel free session. to comment. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Professor Bansu, you have any comments? And Ted, you want some? Well, I agree with with whoever has pointed out the round trip efficiency of batteries is impressive and a little hard to beat with, uh, I mean, to the point that solar fuels people don't talk about their round trip efficiency. So yeah, I, I would say that for, you know, as, as Brett was saying, grid scale storage, when you think of really scalable, dirt cheap um, battery solutions based on earth abundant uh, materials, and it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty urgent and an important area for all the reasons these folks have said. Great. And Brian, you want comments? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> so, okay, so it's a uh, head of the schedule, so, so maybe I'll <laughs> throw in my last question. So, since Brad mentioned, even one like a simple uh, fluoride battery takes 25 years uh, in ideal scenario. <laughs> Then my question is, is the carbon neutral future go realistic or not by 2050? <laughs> so what should be achieved along the way? Like uh, in the 20, for example, 2030, 2040, <laughs> what should be achieved um, uh, to make us on track? Right? And uh, what and how we can contribute as a scientist or engineer? <laughs> Over I, a big, big picture question. You know, you know it's, it's a big challenge to be carbon neutral and honestly, if, if we just continue with the status quo in the United States, I don't want to speak for other countries, but the United States is not on track uh, for carbon neutrality in 2050, unfortunately. Uh, now, now, with that said, that's not a fait accompli. Like, we aren't there yet. We still have 28 years. But things have to change quite a bit to get there, I think. Like, one thing that's very critical to be aware of is just the energy industry is oftentimes investing for decades out into the future. So that means that if people are building natural gas plants or other types of plants today, thankfully they're not building as many coal plants, but they are building lots of natural gas facilities still. And those are going to be expected to last 30 years. So you have to have, uh, first of all, a path to deploy enough solar energy, wind energy, or some other sort of renewable energy to replace all that capacity. So that's number one. But then number two is you have to have some sort of decommissioning plan or way to accelerate like uh, the phase out of these plants. And then you also have to have a way of addressing the shareholder concerns that all the energy companies 
that may not be happy if we go to a carbon neutral future, right? So there are a lot of like practical and political challenges. This is above my pay grade, just to be clear, but I'm just saying we need to be aware of that. With that said though, I think the best thing we can do as scientists and engineers to contribute is to find uh, practical solutions in the context of renewable energy that can be scaled to meet our needs, uh, such as like low cost, high performance photovoltaics, uh, very high performance uh, storage solutions, like both on the battery and solar fuel side. And then also uh, like innovations in terms of the power infrastructure, including the grid that enable both uh, the transmission and uh, storage of energy that's generated through these renewable pathways. And then finally, we need like more creative solutions of how we can use uh, solar energy for a lot of the things that we want to do day to day. And of course, transportation is a, a huge uh, user of energy, but anything in the household, anything that we're doing that currently requires either fuel or batteries or whatever uh, is a potential candidate for uh, solar adoption. So we should think very creatively about that. And that's something that can start even at the undergraduate or high school level. So, so we, we want to start right away. Yeah, great. Who wants to be the next? Uh, Ted, do you want? Uh, thanks, Brett. Uh, <laughs> I will just um, pick up on, I think, on the, on the seemingly very memorable fluoride battery example that Brett surfaced, and just say that I think a lot of those 25 years are going from when we've totally locked down the science that actually works, we've built something small scale, and then we actually work out all of the many, many kinks related to reliability, manufacturability, scale, et cetera. So while I don't have the solution, I will pose the problem uh, which is how do we, once things have actually already reached a really advanced demonstration stage, how do we pull them through faster towards scaled market impact? Um, I'm not sure I'm the kind of person who could even contemplate how to ask that, it, it or how to answer it. It seems like a, a question perhaps for business schools, maybe policy people as well. Some folks interested in manufacturing and scale manufacturing, maybe industrial engineers, um, but I just want to highlight it as, a, as a, a critical question. I guess if you want to say something encouraging, it might be that I, I doubt there's any sort of fundamental uh, kinetic barriers to accelerating that process. Probably there's a lot of money involved somewhere in there, but more than just money. I mean, it's a very intelligent deployment of incentives to try to uh, accelerate adoption. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Yeah, I would uh, I would actually borrow Peter's uh, comment from earlier that I, I, I I'm not going to predict you know what's actually going to happen between now and 2050, but uh, uh, assessing my own role as a as a scientist and an engineer in society, I, I my I view my my job to pr provide you know technological solutions and um, to remove excuses, right? So it's always easy to punt if there's no technological solution. Well, the technology is not there. The technology is not there. Um, when you actually, you know, deliver the technology, and you say no. It's just there's a will. This is what's required now. Um, that's what I think our role is: is to to get the fundamental work to that point and the engineering to that point. So we'll see what what happens. We can have this conversation in 2050 and yeah, see. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, uh, well, excellent points raised here. Uh, my opinion on car carbon neutral by 2050 is that I personally am not that optimistic about it. It doesn't look like, you know, the, 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 the goals are going to be met. But, you know, if we can move, you know, we can move in the right direction, that, that's still something. Uh, my, my feeling is that, you know, the fundamental research that we are doing while excellent is not, you know, directly contributing to these, these lofty goals, which have to be have to be achieved through policy changes, which have to be achieved at, the, at, at a much larger scale. I'm not the best person to comment on that, but you know, from, from where I'm standing, I think you know, probably a lot more needs to be done on, an, on a national, international, global you know, scale you know, through policies. I think like, you know, like infrastructure bill and things that were passed is all you know, in a step in the right direction, but probably a lot more needs to be done, right? I mean, I was having a discussion with a colleague today. I, I'm, 
I, I was always hopeful that the US would have invested a lot more on public transport, for example, right? Would, wouldn't it have been great? But it's, it's just the kind of thing that's never going to happen, I think, because, you know, like, like China has high speed rails, uh, you know, et cetera. But because of the, you know, just the way the rail system was developed in the US, I guess, I mean, it's going to take trillions of dollars, right? So is, that's probably not a direction we'll ever pursue. I mean, I wish we could, but, you know, so, so simple things like, you know, have more public transport so that, you know, uh, people aren't, you know, driving so much or, you, you, of course, we should have more electric cars, but, you know, if, if the only change we make is everybody has an electric car, I mean, you're probably not going to use an electric car to do a long drive. So, you know, so then maybe you're going to fly more. So, you know, so then, you know, th those are our problems as well. So this is, you know, I'm, I'm just speaking as a person more than a scientist here or, you know, more, more than a researcher. But to me, it feels like, you know, probably a lot more needs to be done. But, you know, some things are, you know, there are some things to be optimistic about. But, you know, of course, I, I think a lot more from a policy point of view could, could help, you know, uh, I think probably that needs to be one focus at least. Yeah, I totally agree. The policy is important. But my question is, policy is more important or on the technical side, or do we need a really like a breakthrough theory, like a relativity or quantum <laughs> mechanics, or we can just, just uh, build yeah, everything. If we find the that, that, would, that would help. <laughs> oh, you know, if we can find a boundless source of energy, sure, that would be great. I don't uh, think there's any thermodynamic limitations on us achieving it. It's, yeah. it's, I think it's a technical challenge. Yeah. <laughs> you all agree? Technical. Yeah. Yeah. And how about Shubar? Shubar? <laughs> Great, yeah. Uh, so that's all my questions. Now <laughs> the floor is open. Right? Uh, Brian. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the discussion. Um, so related to maybe not directly what Leitian was asking, but the way that you all answered that question. Um, so we've seen recently a lot of funding support for these um, problems and these, these, these large scale and very urgent problems. So my question is, how important are the people who direct the distribution of these funds? Um, you all at some point mentioned something about policy. Should we be sending a lot of our talented engineers to Washington, uh, the people who know about these problems and understand the technical aspects? Should we be training them at least a little bit in policy and sending them in that way? Um, so that's, that's one question. A sort of related question is, um, you know, we all as academics understand the importance of basic research. With such a large scale urgent problem, should we also think about large scale center type or even larger than center scale research to try to really go after a problem from start to finish and shrink that 25 years down? Um, yeah, <laughs> so, so you asked two very difficult questions, but I'm happy to answer them. Uh, so the first question, there's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all answer, but I would say uh, the federal government, uh, particularly like Tony Blinken when he visited uh, campus recently, noted that it is very important uh, to expand the government ranks to include a lot of people with talent in science and engineering. So. While this is not necessarily something for everybody, I know there are some students who really do have passion for policy and working in the government sector, and I can just tell you your talent is needed. Like, 
Like, you do need to obviously understand something about government. Uh, you shouldn't just go in cold as a pure tech person. But it is important to have that tech background because more and more of the issues we're facing will require a sophisticated understanding of the technological and scientific challenges that we're facing. So I would say I, I'm generally supportive of the direction you're going here. And then the second point about like uh, creating bigger and bigger centers and kind of having those aligned, uh, you know, in terms of the government people and people within academia. I would say you need uh, like to solve like these major challenges. You need like a, a actually a global cooperation framework ultimately, and then that also requires coordination at the national scale and across universities, uh, as well as like the private sector and the public sector. So you basically need all hands on deck solution if you view these as like really ma major challenges. If you don't, then obviously you don't. But but I think like if you said like like our goal as a society is to achieve the maximum decarbonization possible by 2050. It is an all hands on deck effort. Yeah. Any other comments? So to, to, to have more questions from the audience, so probably we don't need to go through everyone. Just if you want to address, you just go ahead. If not, we just move forward. Yeah, I can make a quick comment. I think yeah. the policy uh, question, uh, question is, is, I think it's very important. I think we should focus on that. Like, you know, personally, me during my training as a scientist, I knew very little about, you know, what actually constitutes a policy, probably still don't. You know, I, I read a New York Times article, that's how I know what's what's going on in Washington, right? So I think we should emphasize that. I think, you know, I, I mean, I'm not sure if we can incorporate that in the curriculum itself, but, you know, I hope there could be ways of doing that, like, you know, through seminars, you know, minors, I don't know. I would also emphasize the importance of humanities there as well. I think, you know, we, we don't just want to train excellent, you know, material scientists or chemical engineers, but, you know, uh, the policy decisions that you know would be the most effective they should have an idea on how to how to go about doing that they should also know things like you know which are the most affected areas by climate change and what can we do to instantly help them you know like like things like that so i think you know i i don't know what the the best solution is but i would emphasize that you know it's it's very important i think i think that's a that's a great point i'll, I'll make a very quick comment cuz very interesting question ryan and you're talking, you know, this is a conversation amongst academics, but academia isn't always the best configuration. It has its own incentives that aren't necessarily conducive to solving uh, a problem like this, like to take the battery example or photovoltaic example. And, you know, people make analogies with the moonshots, we use that phrase, or the Manhattan Project. Um, we, we don't ever really... You know, like the Manhattan Project, you had people disrupt their lives to all move to a centralized site to go and accomplish this one goal. And um, I don't know, we, we don't, uh, the center is kind of a halfway point, but even the center itself is also within, a, within an academic context. So, yeah, we, I think we have to ask questions about if, you know, funding academics to act in sort of small team, medium-sized team fashion is always the best way to do it. But I think people are getting creative on the funding side. So you're starting to see more cooperation, very large-scale funding mechanisms. But it's still, at the, it's still in its infancy, I think. Thanks. Can you want to summarize? No, let's get another question before we run out of time. Let's, yeah. let's go to the next question. Yeah, let's go. Uh, 
Professor Lam. <laughs> and Thomas, you'll be next. <laughs> so uh, I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, I want to ask a question about this, uh, the viability of tandem. Uh, tandem was originally developed for space application when the intensity, you can have the intensity more or less constant. But in a solar farm, terrestrial solar farm, the sun moves throughout the day. And the current matching problem is such that you can demonstrate that at the end of the day, single junction is always better than silicon uh, perovskite tandem in terms of efficiency because of this current matching issue. And also silicon is about 1,000 times thicker compared to perovskite. And so therefore, even a small variation, variability leads to a significant drop uh, in efficiency. So I don't fully understand, uh, maybe you can explain a little bit more, that this focus on two-terminal tandem, is it coming purely from thermodynamic considerations or actually there is some underlying uh, calculations or predictions for terrestrial condition that makes it a viable solution? Again, tough question. <laughs> so I turn the expert. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I think I'll invoke other experts, but my understanding is that um, the analysis of tandems uh, looking under real terrestrial conditions um, uh, does actually have them providing an energy yield benefit. Whether they're using one dimensional tracking, I'm not sure, but I wonder if that's maybe the resolution to your conundrum that you need simple tracking, but simple low cost tracking to achieve the energy yield benefit. But my understanding is that you do achieve uh, a, a, you know, a statistically significant benefit in energy yield in the tandems and that that's um, got field measurements behind it and it also has predictions based on real world um, solar arcs and even you know, spectral variations built into that. Yeah, so that was my understanding as well, but I, I agree that uh, fixed tilt is gonna be a problem. So you, you probably need at least single axis tracking for this to be viable. But then the other thing that's important to note is that there are some variations on the two terminal tandems, such as uh, four terminal tandems and other approaches to uh, current matching uh, that are being explored currently. And so, like including the three terminal systems, I should say, like there was some work at NREL recently on the three terminals. And so these are like basically different ways to try to address some of that current variability issue that has like obviously been challenging for the field, not just because of day-to-day -day spectral and uh, solar intensity variations, but then also because of potential degradation on the perovskite. So, uh, I think that this is like obviously a key area of research uh, to make perovskites potentially uh, commercially viable, to have like kind of a long-term stable solution so you won't have to like reapply a new perovskite every couple of months or something. Yeah, great. So let's move on to the next question. Jonathan? Uh, yeah, I have a question about the stability of this perovskite. I don't work on the photovoltaic, but I work on other electrochemical device system. I know like if that's a, that stability is because of some dynamics or kinetics, that they're doomed. We, we cannot do that because that, if that's because of engineering problem, then they maybe can solve. So my question here is maybe probably for the modeling part, you can calculate some dynamics and kinetics. Do you think that is a, that problem because of the unsta unstable some dynamics or the, just the, the degradation too fast or still don't know yet? I, I, I don't think that the perovskite is intrinsically, in a, it, it's, it's not metastable. So I, I don't think that there's fundamentally any reason why we can't stabilize these things. That being said, uh, Letine was alluding to the fact that the ease of processability, the fact that this is an ionic solid means that it's it does have an intrinsic susceptibility to certain stressors like water. So, uh, but 
we don't. We still are um, looking into strategies like I mean, we've been shocked, for instance, by you know putting down a mono layer of something can have qualitative impacts on uh, you know water susceptibility and ion diffusion, and uh, this is very early in research. So anyway, I don't think there's again. I don't think we're at, I can certainly answer that there's nothing fundamentally thermodynamically unstable about the materials. But uh, they do have some intrinsic susceptibilities that have to be addressed. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, computationally, when we look at the stability of, you know, just a, a perovskite crystalline structure, you know, we, we probably only look at, you know, which phases will it decompose to, what is the enthalpy involved in it. Maybe we can, you know, do some, you know, bring in entropy, you know, things like configuration entropy, vibration entropy, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, maybe there are limits to, you know, for what we can uh, predict from, from computations. Like, you know, it may be printed to be stable, but we, there may be pathways that we are missing. I think it's also important to take uh, defects into account uh, at, at, at that point. Like, you know, which a, a compound may come out to be, you know, stable against decomposition, but, you know, there may be certain you know, point defects that could form spontaneously. So there are ways in which uh, simulations can help uh, address that. But yeah, but I agree that, you know, the, it's not like an intrinsically unstable material, but there are ways in which it is, you know, thermally or mechanically or, you know, uh, photo uh, stability is, is bad or, you know, things like that. So not all of that can maybe be addressed, you know, using certain, you know, using first principle simulations, but there are ways in which we could maybe do one level of screening where we eliminate ones that are obviously going to be you know, unstable research to, you know, decomposition to constituent halides, for example, or, or something like that. Yeah. Great. Last question. Um, be brief. <laughs> Thompson, please. Uh, well, thank you all for a great discussion. Thank you all for a great discussion so far. Maybe one last big picture philosophical question. The, research, the solar energy research community has finite resources. There's only so many hours in the day. How much should we be putting our effort towards, you know, any one specific material system like perovskites? versus, you know, looking for new materials that nobody's even thinking about right now. Should we let our guest have the last word? <laughs> I was going to say Brent knows the answer to this one. <laughs> uh, well, it is a very exciting time to be doing computational work because uh, we can consider so many materials, right? So actually, the, the, the cost of exposure exploration right now has almost never been lower from a simulation perspective. So that's very exciting. Um, you know, we use these terms like uh, breaking the sort of Edisonian paradigm where you actually have to synthesize the thing and test it. I mean, we're trying to accelerate that thousands to million fold uh, using simulations. Nevertheless, if you're dealing with a long gap, a development life, lifetime on the decades time scale, I think we do need to be investing in today's technologies. So. Great. Any That's other comments? Um, I would just say that uh, the cost of the early stage investigations is always going to be a small fraction of the overall amount of money we're spending on research, development, and engineering. Uh, so. So it is going to be important to cast a wide net at early stages. We're also going to have to be really ruthless in terms of narrowing at that down. Because there are a lot of materials that I've seen over the years that people thought should be incredibly good for PV. And they were like so excited about it. And then they tried to build a cell. And then it's like less than 1% efficiency. I'm not saying this to pick on anybody, but just to say that it's a long and difficult road to develop these materials. And we need to be aware that there will be a lot of failures along the way. But perovskite is definitely a very promising path. But again, uh, it has to compete with some very like impressive technology that's already been around for a number of years. So it is a, a challenging hill to climb, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Ted uh, have a very brief summary and then we can <laughs> end the session. Well, I, th I think these guys got it right. I agree with their analysis that actually we, we can't spread our bets too much for the reasons we're all aware of but that we do have to have some stuff that's further along that will push towards commercial impact. But we have to feed the pipeline. It's actually back to the point we've all made a few times about basic science. I mean, investing in basic science is really feeding the pipeline of talent like you guys, feeding the pipeline of ideas, and feeding the pipeline of knowledge so that we can then mature the technologies that are winning. So I do think we need a, a little bit of a pipeline strategy.
Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so our time is up. Let's thank uh, all the panelists again. Particularly, thank Professor Sargent <laughs> to come to Peru, share his wisdom with us. Okay, and uh, thank you very much for attending, and thank, thanks the College of Engineering <laughs> to organize this wonderful event. Okay, thank you.